from our headquarters in Kiev. This is the Sunday show on Romansky International, the only prime time TV program explaining the Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I am Natalia Humenyuk. Here is, is what we have prepared for you today. World leaders and top experts converge on Ukraine for the Yalta European Strategy Conference held in Kyiv. What they had to say about the UN peacekeepers in the Donbas, fighting corruption and the future of Ukrainian economy. Moscow and Minsk carry out extensive military exercises on Belarusian territory. Why the country's Eastern European neighbors are worried? A children's book depicting an LGBT family sparks controversy in Ukraine. Why the right-wing backlash may have made Maya and her mothers the hit of the season and how the society supports the writer. For the full version of our interviews and reports, go to our webpage en.hromatsky.ua, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, search Hromatsky International. We will be back in a second. World leaders and Experts converge uh, on Ukraine to visit the Yalta European Strategy Gathering, which is a huge conference started by the Ukrainian businessman and oligarch, but later become the place to meet for the people interested in Ukraine. Uh, there are very uh, important names like John Kerry and uh, Condoleezza Rice, the former secretaries of state, a number of the European officials. But what the most interesting, this is the rare chance when the Ukrainian leaders like President Poroshenko or Prime Minister Groisman would answer the question of international uh, experts and um international community on what they are interested. Uh, we have here with us David Patrikarakos, who is a British journalist who spent his time in Ukraine, working here a lot, and he's the author of forthcoming book, War in 140 Characters, How Social Media is Reshaping Conflict in 21st Century. And David had uh, been, for this particular event, uh, it moved from an ex-Crimea for the last four years after the start of the war. So what is your impression? It's already the time to, you know, once a year, it's a bit of the measurement of the temperature here. You're absolutely right, Natalia. It's great to be back in Kiev again. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, each year I come here and there is a gathering of the great and the good, as you say. And uh, Mr. Pinchuk flies in, very important people from all around the world. But for me, what's most interesting is, is getting to see the Ukrainians asking, holding their politicians to account and taking the mood of the country and, you know, seeing it change from year to year. And what I noticed this year was there was definitely definitely more positivity around uh, a lot of the, you, my Ukrainian friends, my Ukrainian journalistic colleagues, uh, my Ukrainian friends in government than there was last year. Last year there seemed to be a lot of frustration with the lack of reforms, a lot of frustration about continuing corruption. Now obviously this has not gone away, obviously this is still an issue, but there is definitely a more positive atmosphere at this YES conference than I, I saw last year. And certainly the couple of ones before that when the war was at its height. And uh, to start with, we we'll, would like uh, we will have a number of topics, including the security peacekeeping operation, which might uh, have take place. Uh, we'll start with the, um, the the what the president Poroshenko said on particular issue of establishing anti-corruption court, and the very uh, popular here answer of John Kerry, former U.S. State Secretary. And I want to ask all of you. Could you raise the hand if in your countries exist anti-corruption court? In any of your countries? Maybe in France, maybe in Poland, maybe in Sweden, maybe in Germany, maybe in the United States? Where? What nation has an independent court with respect to corruption? Well, the truth is in our nation every court is anti-corruption. And, uh, and even now, you see a special prosecutor investigating the President of the United States. And there is state investigation and there's federal investigation. 
why we have picked up that issue at Romansk International, because usually the issue which is uh, largely discussed at this event is yes. the most acute issue. So now we're speaking about the establishing of the anti-corruption court. Uh, there is the uh, conditionality with that, but all of a sudden we have the president and the prosecutor general not really pushing forward. Uh, so this is the Ukrainian debate. But um, without going to the details, you know, do you think there is a real trust into President Poroshenko and leadership of the country from what you talk to the expert, uh, the Western experts? Does he sound like repetitive? He's very good in criticizing Russia, but do you think there were substantial answers on really what people want to hear from where the country is moving? Well, I mean, I think, you know, by the nature of his position, he will always give highly political answers, that is to say, extremely boring ones, and not and try to say as little as possible. Now, Poroshenko is an interesting one, because I followed his career since he was elected. Now, when he was elected, he was elected by quite a majority. He was, you know, he was seen as, you know, by many, the best of a bad bunch. You know, there wasn't huge enthusiasm for him. Also, he's an oligarch. He's, he's a man of the establishment. I mean, it in his case, it's chocolate, so it's more benign than most people made their money. But nonetheless, I mean, look, it's a, it's, it's a, a variety of, of conflicting opinions when I speak to people about Boroshenko. You know, some people still think he's for the best. Other people say that he's, you know, hasn't moved fast enough on reforms. He hasn't delivered on his reforms. But, you know, uh, you know as, uh, as we've discussed previously, I think you have to look at what he's facing, which is a Ukrainian state that since independence has been based financially on corruption. And this takes a generation to remove. It doesn't take three years. But uh, there are, for a while, talks about the Ukrainian fatigue. Yeah. And is it also the fatigue on Poroshenko or also on Ukraine? And particularly, that's why I mentioned that, you know, like, you can't listen to Poroshenko. He's telling the same things all the time. So how it goes together? Look, I, I think politicians say the same thing a lot. I mean, Donald Trump's been talking about building a wall since he first entered politics. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's not that. I think, it, unfortunately, and it's very sad to me as someone who cares about Ukraine, that there is Ukraine fatigue. Um, you know, when I was here in 2014, I mean, it was the biggest subject, global political, geopolitical subject. I mean, people could not get enough of Ukraine. And, you know, you see this at the Yes Conference. You, you talked to Natalia about the Yes Conference taking the temperature. But it also takes the temperature of external interest in Ukraine. And, you know, the first year, 2014, the, you know, every major journalist, you know, uh, newspaper, uh, you know, American and British had a, a correspondent here. This year, there were far fewer. It still got many great people from around the world. But I think simply, you know, it's Ukraine fatigue. And unfortunately, in our industry, as they said, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. If the war starts up again intensely, then you'll see a return of interest. But unfortunately for now, you know, there is Ukraine fatigue. I don't think you can blame that on Poroshenko. I think it's just the way the news cycle works in our social media age. People have tiny attention spans. And uh, another quote where I'd like to bring is the quote by Prime Minister Groisman. Uh, he doesn't speak often, that often, to uh, foreign media in particular, and he's not that uh, outspoken personality. So that was, uh, he, th that was interesting to listen to what he was answering. We see that through the adoption of one law about privatization that these are revolutionary laws submitted by the government. This will provide for the development of the national economy. To break something is not to build something. You can break something very quickly, but the effort to construct comes later. I am deeply convinced that every month, every year, people will start to feel that the situation is improving. There is a lot of pessimism in society now, and I understand these people because they have been suffering for years. But I see the prospects for the development of the Ukrainian economy. I see new jobs. We are going to new markets now. We had to leave the traditional Russian markets and switch to new markets. Today, the European Union is responsible for more than 44% of trade. Not long ago, it was only 37%. We have new institutions to support investment, to support Ukrainian exports. We are putting stimulating programs into our draft budget that are able to provide for the quality support of Ukrainian agriculture. We have a lot to do to stabilize the situation, but we know how to do it. The fact is he is now in the country, and as we understand it, he plans to be here in Kiev next week. So my simple question is, what are you and, and the government and the authorities in Ukraine going to do about this situation? Nothing. I don't know what to do in such a situation. 
What to do with populace? Let society deal with it. Whatever I do as Prime Minister together with my government, I will do in the name and on behalf of Ukrainians. That was an answer of the Ukrainian Prime Minister of what would happen uh, when uh, the next week uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, former Georgian president and Odessa governor, uh, would come back to Kiev. Uh, that is also an issue, of course, and that's what I uh, heard also from a lot of people. So how uh, the community you were speaking also was discussing that. I supporting Saakashvili, speaking against him. Yeah. He was the guest of this conference for the last years. I remember that. I remember it well, yes, he was quite a fated guest. Look, the Sankashvili issue is really, um, you know, it's really very heated. Uh, and I've seen on social media lots of friends, Ukraine experts, uh, you know, American Ukrainians, Canadian Ukrainians, really debating this issue and really getting angry. Um, but I think, you know, there, you know, there has to come a point where you cannot just crash through the borders of a sovereign state. You know, you can't behave like that. Um, you know, I mean, he was stateless. I mean, perhaps he hasn't been treated as fairly as he should have been or he thinks he should have been. But you can't crash through the borders of a state with a mob. I mean, you just don't behave like that. I mean... The answer of Prime Minister was, we'll do nothing. And that's exactly probably there was this open question and it remains open. And I would like to go also to the economy uh, more in, uh, in depth and also the, uh, what, ha what is happening with the reformers in the government because they are always the faces of the Ukrainian reforms. Uh, but sometimes we can believe that there is some difference between what is shown uh, for the external audience and what is happening um, on the ground. Uh, so uh, we would like to give you a quote of uh, Paul Krugman, uh, the uh, Nobel laureate on economy who had traveled to Kiev this time and also the former economy minister, uh, Minister Abramovich's. As later appeared, uh, you know, our independent thinking was uh, perhaps uh, too independent for someone's uh, sake and uh, it was not uh, possible really to, uh, to carry on. But with my resignation, I believe uh, I paved the way for less interference uh, into the work of the colleagues uh, that stayed. I see people now rallying, good people rallying around the Prime Minister, uh, certainly around the Minister of Healthcare, Minister of Finance, a few other sort of the islands uh, of uh, reforms, of uh, progress and of hope. But uh, again, we would need uh, that type of situation to prevail in uh, more institutions to, to, uh, to, to, to make a bigger impact. Uh, one, of, one of the difficult uh, things uh, when I was in the government was uh, uh, to really, and, and the biggest mistakes was that uh, all of those uh, new Ukraine, so to say, uh, representatives uh, had difficulties uniting, and therefore we were taken out one by one. And uh, clearly, the bad guys have no problems, uh, you know, uh, working for the common goal. The good guys have always problems uniting. Who's going to be the first on the stage? Who's going to be first on the list uh, to speak? Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, it is very clear that we're still in the middle of a crisis of values. So it's actually been quite impressive, given the, the nature of the crisis that Ukraine went through in 2014-15 to see the economy stabilized. It's not, it's not a roaring boom, but at least off the bottom, some of the danger signals have really receded. They've gone from red lights to yellow lights in terms of, of budget deficits um, and, and inflation. Um, and what's striking, given the theme of what I've been talking about, is that you know, how did Ukraine do that? It did that pretty much in a familiar way. The Ukrainian turnaround looks a lot for someone with my background, looks a lot like uh, successful reforms in, in developing countries and, oh, that have happened many, many times. It looks like, like uh, reforms that worked in, in, um, uh, in Latin America, uh, getting away from a commitment to an unsustainable exchange rate, uh, letting a combination of depreciation and, and uh, rebalancing domestically bring you back into sustainable territory. Uh, that's not a, it doesn't solve all your problems. If you want to ask, you know, what, how, do we, uh, <laughs> how do you achieve really major economic growth? How do you really achieve an economic takeoff? The answer is uh, we don't know, uh, and we never have. So in that sense, things have not changed. Uh, but if we ask 
Uh, do we know how to at least produce a situation which is not boiling over? We do, we, and, um, and Ukraine has done that. David, so r a rather optimistic view from the world-known economist, but grew kind of pretty pessimistic view from the Ukrainians who were trying to deal with the issues. So is there, you feel that there is some disbelief in the young reformers? That's what the former minister of the economy said, that they didn't make it, you know. So do you think there is a hope that there's still this new generation is something, you know, the, well, the Western investors would trust? Well, I think, I mean, you know, a lot of hope was placed in this generation of reformers um, because obviously the one thing about, well, one of the many things about Maidan is it galvanized civil society. Uh, and it created, you know, activists who became politicians. I mean, Mustafa from, you know, from your own channel is an example of that. You know, um, and so there is a generation, people like Hannah Hopko, people like that, who did great work before, who are now in the RADA. But I think that, you know, it's possible that too much expectation was put on their shoulders. Because, again, we go back to problems that are entrenched and generational. And what would be the maybe untold stories? We're having the, you know, an opportunity here that you think the West or the foreign audience doesn't get from Ukraine enough. The untold story. Uh, I mean, look, the, uh, well, it's not untold, but I think people need to focus on what's happening in the East more again. Uh, you know, it seems to have dropped off the radar, but people are still getting hurt there. It's calmed down a lot. Other than that, I think that people need to understand Kiev. I saw recently it was voted one of the most unlivable cities in the world. I mean, it's complete nonsense. Kiev is one of, you know, it's one of the most dynamic and thriving European capitals that I've been to, which is why I come here so often. So I think there needs to be a general level of knowledge about Ukraine, not just politically, but culturally and socially. That's, that's what I feel. I feel that it's, it has a warped image in the public consciousness. You know, it's a, think it's thought of as a place of war for obvious reasons, or, a, you know, a, a grim Soviet reform republic, which is yeah, very far from the case. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful place, and I think people need to do that. And it's a, look, it's a place with a lot of potential. It has a lot of natural resources. This country can feed, the, you know, can feed Europe, basically. You know, it has a lot going for it. The problem with Ukraine is, is, is the people, is the politicians. The, the actual, you know, landscape, the soil, the, everything that you have is great. But as it's often the case, you know, the politicians, although they're getting better, for 20 years, you know, essentially stole from the country. I mean, but at this, uh, at this point, at this segment of the program, we have to move to the conflict and war because that is the very acute issue. And particularly this week, the president was, would, of Ukraine will travel to the uh, United States, to the UN General Assembly. He will meet uh, US President Trump. But also there would be issue of... Uh, creating the peacekeeping operation uh, here in the Ukrainian Donbas. Uh, it has really become the issue. I would also uh, explain uh, the issue was raised a couple of years ago, but I can confirm that it had become serious. So the high-level politician I'm speaking, uh, speaking on that will provide those uh, details uh, within the next minutes. But where is the where is the story is that now the controversy is over where to have this peacekeeping mission, either on the contact, contact line, that is the Russian proposal at the moment, and then it would mean that this separatist territory kind of uh, Ukraine accept that it's not its part. And Ukraine definitely wants that if that there would be full control over this territory and if the UN is getting involved we definitely have the people uh, people there so I probably would start uh, with the command of the Ukrainian Minister for Foreign Affairs who really explain what they would like to put on table. The mandate of such a peacekeeping mission should involve the removal of Russian forces from the occupied territory of Ukraine's eastern Donbass region and should eliminate all troops, mercenaries and military equipment brought into this area by Russia. And the first steps to achieving stabilization and a return to normalcy include, for example, disarmament. Who is going to take care of this? It obviously won't be just Russia's mission. Consultations are now taking place about the OSCE's responsibility in this mission. I met with the Secretary General of the OSCE and will meet with him again in New York, and also about the direction of the peacekeeping mission. The purpose of this is to establish an effective period that will lead up to elections in the Donbas, and obviously nobody will agree that Russia should have full control of structuring and carrying out the electoral process.
What we are going to discuss in the Security Council, the first resolution on a UN peacekeeping mission in the Donbass, will be what diplomats refer to as technical. It can be a push for the Secretary General, and there will be meetings with the Secretary General in New York to send out the mission to the region and to outline what the results of such a mission should be. And then the mission returns and we discuss the mandate. It's important to understand that according to the first resolution, a detailed mandate does not yet exist. And this process won't include just one resolution. Journal Journalists and others often ask, will the first resolution determine everything? It won't, as it never does. The presence of the aggressor, Russia, in this mission is just a crazy thing. How can Russia, the country that occupied the Donbass territory, be present in this mission? First of all, I can't speak on behalf of the President of the United States on what he will bring up during the meeting, but we will definitely discuss the situation in the occupied Donbass. We will discuss common tactics, which we already discussed with Kurt Volker. We will certainly talk about security cooperation, and we will talk about the U.S.'s support for Ukraine's reforms. Well, I think that this is very interesting. I mean, the idea of a peacekeeping force in fact, seems to me, to be honest, an expression, if the Russians are indeed serious, an expression that they have not achieved their goals in the Eastern Donbass. I think, um, you know, we have this view that Russians are chess playing grandmasters thinking 20 moves ahead, when, as I've seen from my time in Donbass, in the Donbass, in Luhansk, Donetsk, Lobyansk, around the Baltava, um, it's not quite the case. And I've also seen it with their propaganda. Now, I think, you know, in a way, if Russia is serious about this, it's a way of essentially trying to extricate itself from the situation without losing face. So it can look like the good guy saying we'll put in UN peacekeepers because, you know, there are quote unquote separatists, even though when I was in, uh, I was, I was there in April 2014 and I was in Donetsk uh, on the second night that they st stormed the building and there must have been 200 people there in a city of, what, a million? During the Iranian revolution, eight million people came out onto the streets. So, you know, I mean, there wasn't a huge amount of support for the separatists that I saw anyway. Uh, you know, pro-Russia, the sentiment, yes, that was slightly different. But I think this is very interesting. I think that um, it means that Russia is essentially accepted that it's not going to get its way in Ukraine. It's pouring resources into Ukraine. It doesn't have the money. It's got a declining economy. The price of oil is very low. Putin needs a face-saving exercise. This could be it. It could be good for Ukraine. I expect there to be a lot of squabbling over sovereignty and borders. Um, but for the moment, um, I think I see it as a sign of Russian, you know, the Russians saying, OK, hey, we've run out of ideas. So is, uh, yeah, are Russians serious? This is the question which is asked by everybody. Uh, Kurt Walker, who had been... Um, uh, who, who has become the U.S. special envoy on Ukraine, Ukraine negotiations, that's how it's uh, named, uh, is the person to know. So we ask the questions him and in particular provide this, um, this uh, comment for you that from that diplomatic answer you would probably read. How do you feel? Is it serious or not? Are this issue really on table? We, we've seen a conflict here for three years. The Minsk negotiations had been getting stuck, that there was a circular discussion about security and political implementation, and nothing was happening. The ceasefire was never being implemented. Uh, people were dying, you know, a couple people a week uh, would die. So getting out of that cycle of failure, basically, getting out of that, let's, let's not call it a failure, but stagnation, Getting out of that cycle of stagnation is important. A peacekeeping force, if there were one, that had responsibility for the area, instead of Russian forces being there occupying the area, could be a way to provide security for people and provide access for Ukrainian authorities, to provide a space where you can have elections, a space where you can see the implementation of the Minsk agreements. So that's the, the idea behind a peacekeeping force. It, it's very interesting that Russia proposed a UN protection force in New York. Up until that point, Russia had not been bringing this up in New York, and in fact, it said it didn't like the idea of the UN. So this is a step forward in a way 
bringing it up for discussion and bringing it to the Security Council. Now, the terms of the mandate that Russia has proposed, I am concerned, would only deepen the division in Ukraine. It would be along the line of the ceasefire, not throughout the whole area. It would only protect monitors, not people. It would not give access to the to controlling the Russia-Ukraine border. So there's a lot of obstacles, a lot of problems with the way it was proposed. But it opens a discussion. And I hope that through that dialogue, we can talk about the idea of a genuine peacekeeping force, and one that would be focused on security throughout the entire area, one that would con control the Ukrainian side of the Ukraine-Russia border, and one that would provide for the containment and monitoring of heavy weapons. If we do that, I think it meets all of the other conditions and allows for a political process to go forward. But we're not producing our own document. Um, there is a proposal by Russia. It is as I described. It doesn't do everything that it needs to do to bring the country together. It would actually deepen the divide. A peacekeeping force that has area security responsibility, that provides for the containment and monitoring of heavy weapons, and that's control of the Ukrainian side of the Ukraine-Russia border. Russia proposed this idea in New York. We're on the Security Council, Ukraine's on the Security Council, France, Germany, Japan, Sweden, others. Though we are talking about this, we'll talk about this in New York next week. We'll, I'll have a further bilateral meeting with uh, my Russian counterpart sometime in October. So there will be dialogue about this. It's more important at this stage to get the principles right. I think it would be unreasonable to expect Russia to go to the United Nations and propose our position. Uh, and they're not going to do that. They're going to go in and say, here's what Russia would love to see. But the fact that they did this, I think, is very interesting and should be taken seriously. Uh, they weren't talking about this in New York before. They weren't talking about a UN force before. That's now on the table as a Russian proposal. So I think that's very interesting. And I think the way we get to these questions of mandate and scope is to sit down with the Russians and talk it through. Um, the issues driving this are not paper negotiations in New York. The issues driving it are Russia's sense that the status quo is not good for anybody. It's not good for Russia. It's not good for the people of the Donbass. It's not good for Ukraine. And if we can find a better way forward, let's work to do that. So that's where how I think we get to reshaping those discussions about the mandate. We see sanctions. We see questions about you know security assistance for Ukraine. We see uh, clarity of you know just. You know, concern and clarity of information about Russia's role in all of this. Uh, President Trump telling President Putin that the U.S.-Russia relationship will not be getting better as long as this issue is not resolved. Um, the worsening diplomatic climate between the U.S. and Russia for other reasons, our, our embassies and consulates and personnel. So there's a sense that we need to start finding things to build on. So I think all of those things come together to create a climate in which it's actually worth trying to solve this. Maybe one other thing I would add is I think Russia is realizing that its invasion and occupation of part of Ukraine has resulted in a Ukraine that is more uh, unified, more nationalist, more westward looking, more anti-Russian than before. And this is clearly not something Russia intended, and I think it's having to think through how would it like to recalibrate. The, the topic of my conversations with Mr. Surkov are the restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, and safety and security for all Ukrainian citizens, regardless of ethnicity, nationality, or religion. That's what the goal is. And I think that Russia, on paper, subscribes to those goals. Uh, the Minsk process says it's restoring Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Russia itself talks about the importance of safety for Russian-speaking people. So what we need to talk about is how to do it. Um, we got into this circular discussion in the Normandy and Minsk process. What comes first, security uh, or political process? I'm hoping we can break out of that circular argument. If we did have a peacekeeping force, as we were just discussing, that could create time and space for moving forward on the political steps under Minsk. 
Ukraine does have responsibilities agreed to under the Minsk agreements uh, about, uh, for instance, elections, about special status, about amnesty, things that the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian parliament already passed in the past. And I understand that it can't be implemented when Ukraine can't even access this territory. But if we can change this discussion, we have security in the area, we have access into those areas, then Ukraine will have to follow through on those things too, as it said it would. I don't have any doubt about it. I just recognize it couldn't happen until now um, or until there is security. Uh, but once we have that, I think that would be the follow through. Another issue which uh, Walker um, said that he answered on the question on Crimea, that it's a separate issue, but there is no compromise on that. So because there is, there are those rumors, and maybe the Crimea would be the bargain. But still, you see this firm position of the UN Special Envoy, yet the Donald Trump is in the White House, and a lot of people still think, you know, doesn't matter that you have Pentagon head, the State Secretary, we, it's still unpredictable. I, look, you said it, unpredictable. I mean, who knows? Donald Trump, he contradicts himself, not even weekly, daily, hourly. You know, he'll tweet one thing one hour, he'll tweet another thing the next hour. Who knows? I mean, he has talked tough on Ukraine. He's talked, you know, he said that, you know, uh, if Russia doesn't behave, he will do X, Y, Z on Ukraine. But in the end of the day, this is Donald Trump. And you cannot predict this man. You just cannot. Uh, from what I hear, you know, he exasperates many of the people around him, a lot of the generals. I mean, you've seen him, you know. I mean, Rex Tillerson had to come out and say, the president does not speak for me. I mean, he had to disavow. Can you remember, think of any example of a secretary of state coming out and disavowing their own president. So this is the thing. You just do not know with Donald Trump. It could be, you know, it could be something as that he has a bad Russian meal for breakfast. You just don't know with Donald David, Trump. David, thanks so much for co-hosting this segment to, uh, with us and making this roundup of the reforms and the security agenda and foreign relations. And uh, with that, I also propose the interview of my colleague, Tatiana Ogarkova, who had made it with another U.S. expert, Stephen Pfeiffer, who represents the Brookings Institutions and used to be the ambassador here in Kiev. My first question will be about the most maybe important issue discussed in Ukraine. It's about peacekeepers in Donbass. It's very discussed. So what, what, what is your opinion? Well, we don't yet know whether President Putin's proposal was serious or not. I tend to be very skeptical. Uh, I think it was designed to portray an image of a Moscow that's interested in settlement. But I think we should test it. And it seems to me the way to test it is at the UN Security Council in New York is for Ukraine to work with countries like the United States, Britain, and France on the Security Council and reshape that proposal so that you have a robust peacekeeping proposal that applies not just on the line of contact, but throughout all of occupied Donbass, including on the Ukraine-Russian border, and has a Chapter 7 mandate. Now, if the Russians are prepared to do something like that, I'll think they're serious. But my guess is Moscow's not prepared to see that kind of peacekeeping force. So you're rather skeptical about Putin's willingness to, to introduce peacekeepers on the whole territory of Donbass? I'm skeptical. I mean, I, I still, from what I can see, think that the Russians seem content with the kind of simmering conflict that you now have in Donbass. Uh, I would like to be wrong on that. Uh, and that's why I would like to see the Russian proposal tested. I mean, if the Russians are looking for a way out of the quagmire that they have themselves in Donbass, we ought to find a way to help them. But I don't yet know that the Russian proposal is serious. Another important issue to Ukraine is less of arms so from the United States to Ukraine. It's an issue discussed also all the time in the media. And some people say, some experts say that maybe they will believe it next year. This decision can be taken this year. What is your evaluation? Well, my impression is from talking to people in the government that within the U.S. government, there's actually widespread support for the idea to the point where the vice chairman of the American Joint Chiefs of Staff a couple of months ago told Congress that both U.S. European Command, that's the commander for American military forces in Europe, and the Joint Chiefs have made the recommendation to provide lethal military assistance. But this is going to be a question ultimately for the president. Uh, when I asked a couple of weeks ago, uh, the president had not yet made the decision. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. It is though interesting because compared to say a, a couple of years ago when this issue came up in the Obama administration, at that point in time, 
you did not have U.S. government officials expressing a view on supporting, even though privately they did. And I find it interesting that now you have American officials being prepared to say in public that they support the idea. I don't know if that suggests where President Trump will go, uh, but I just find it interesting, and I hope there's a the right decision by the president. Uh, president Poroshenko will be meeting Trump next week. Um, they will be talking about many issues, we guess. Uh, what should we wait from this meeting? Well, one thing is, uh, one part of the meeting that's important is just the fact that the meeting is having. President Trump is not going to have time for lots of bilaterals, so it, it signifies to me that the fact that he's chosen to meet with President Poroshenko, I mean, there was a decision there which in part is calculated to single American support for Ukraine. Uh, my guess is they'll they'll talk about a number of the issues. They'll talk about Russian aggression, perhaps about the peacekeeping proposal. I mean, there's a lot of issues to discuss on the U.S.-Ukraine agenda. But for me, the starting point is, in terms of importance, is the fact that the meeting is happening. This week, Russia and Belarus began their joint military exercise known as Zapad 2017, which will continue until September 20th. The exercises which are taking place on Belarusian territory include around 13,000 soldiers and approximately 680 military vehicles and artillery units. Here you can see the numbers. While both Russia and Belarus insist that the exercises are defensive in nature, their proximity to Europe has provoked fair from neighboring countries like Ukraine as well the Baltic states which are members of NATO alliance. Here you can see also the locations of the military exercise. You may see they are spread all over the country close to Polish Ukrainian border. Kiev is worried that the Russian troops won't leave Belarusian territory and cross the Ukrainian border after the exercises. Meanwhile Belarus has its own concerns about about Russia's military presence on its territory. For insight into Zappa 2017, uh, we can talk to Viktor Malyshevsky, editor-in-chief of Belarusian radio station Euroradio. What do you hear about the Zapad 2017 exercises in Belarus? Are they important and what is expected from them? They aren't exactly important to the average Belarusian, but average Belarusians follow the scandals that begin with the exercise. Such Russian Belarusian exercises take place every few years and they call them Zapad. The frequency isn't important, but every time there are scandals surrounding these exercises. In 2012, for example, everyone was concerned that a nuclear attack against Warsaw was being worked out in the exercise. And was it rehearsed in the exercises? No, it was a scenario that everyone feared. The exercises, and we emphasize this, are always defensive in character. This was really stressed this time as well. These scenarios are also very interesting. This time everyone is afraid of two things. Belarusians are afraid that the Russian contingent of troops that will enter Belarus will stay there. It's understandable. Everyone is afraid that it will be like in Ukraine. The second thing that everyone is afraid of is that they won't stay there and that they will go somewhere else, somewhere west, somewhere north. Lithuania is the most concerned. It causes concern in Lithuania. The exercises began with the scandal because some information was allegedly leaked that showed that on Belarusian territory there was a tender by the Russian Ministry of Defense for the delivery of military trains to Belarusian territory. And it turned out that there were several tens of thousands of them. Experts have estimated that during the exercises there will be 500,000 Russian soldiers on Belarusian territory. The Russian Ministry of Defense denied this. They said there was a mistake. And such mistakes or such denials, they happen periodically. And every time they provoked a splash of emotions in Belarus and neighboring countries. Experts even agree that maybe Russia itself provokes the discussion of these exercises, which in principle are really typical. There's been many of them. What do the Zap 2017 exercises look like? Very curious. There are three fictional countries. They gave them some very strange names. 
But only one country caught public attention in Belarus. This is Vaishnoria, which is located in the Grodno region of Belarus. And someone is trying to launch an attack on Belarusian territory from these three states. But not just to seize a chunk of territory. Rather, they are some kind of terrorist organization or separatists trying to attack in order to cause conflict between the members of the Russian Belarusian Union state for some reason. If we shift to the situation that's happening in the world now, it looks like the idea that some separatist or terrorist separatist organizations have emerged and are attacking some small region of Belarus, and Belarus asked for Russia's help in eliminating these conflicts. It's as if Ukraine asked for Russia's help in eliminating the Donetsk People's Republic, Igor Strzelkov's separatist group and others. There is no one will be fighting against NATO in these exercises? No, it seems they will not. Is NATO a terrorist organization? As it turns out, no. But judging by the amount of combat equipment involved, not so weak terrorist organizations are going to attack us. I know that the appearance of these imaginary states has caused a lot of jokes. Tell me about how Belarusians are joking about the exercises. The Belarusians made a very strange joke. They have suddenly taken one of the aggressors as their own. This is Vaishnoria, which is located in the Grodno region of Belarus. Everyone here has already started to compare. Who lives there, there's a map of Vaishnoria. It seems that in 2004, those who lived there voted for Zenon Pozniak in the elections. Pozniak was the opposition candidate, the most important opposition forces. Everyone took a look and yes, it's on the border with Lithuania and everyone wanted to live in Vaishnoria which will be the winner of these exercises. The internet has already issued Vaishnorian passports. Everyone is actively obtaining them, signing them. It's a type of ID, a Vaishnorian passport, Vaishnoria t-shirt. There are a lot of jokes. Economists are already jokingly, or perhaps not joking, discussing how we will restore the economy after the victory of Vaishnoria in these exercises. So it turns out that someone has already managed to do business on this story. I don't know about business, but everyone is hyping it. How do ordinary citizens perceive these military exercises? This doesn't concern ordinary citizens strongly. It only concerns the political powers that are conducting some kind of political events when these exercises are taking place. Russian soldiers, stay away from Belarus. These were the slogans such as this. Ordinary people are only concerned in the event that someone is called up as a reservist. We have such partisans who are being called upon. There will probably be around 1,500 of such people. Ordinary people are only concerned in terms of these jokes which are spreading on social networks. Young people are now actively joking. That's all, nothing more. Russia is interested in there being scandals surrounding these exercises, because if there are scandals, it draws more attention. All the scandals are linked to the fact that Russia needs to be feared, and Russia doesn't hide the fact that it likes that. Be afraid, just in case. Only Belarus loses in geopolitical terms. It seems that Belarus has to agree with Russia every time. Belarus has to justify itself because of Russia. Belarus cannot refuse Russia. And moreover, the Belarusian Ministry of Defense states, for example, that Russian troops began arriving in Belarusian territory for the exercises. If you understand that this is a scandalous topic and if it causes negative reaction in society, it's better not to speak in official messages, to not throw wood on the fire. But the Ministry of Defense throws it with pleasure. At the same time, they don't hold press conferences for journalists, but briefings in which one can't ask questions and can only hear about the nature of the exercises. And we have currently our correspondent working in Belarus and will be bringing the on-the-ground reports. Please stay tuned.
This is just a children's book, but it has already become a major hit and source of controversy in Ukraine. Maya and her mother depict different types of families and promote inclusiveness and acceptance. But a number of far-right and religious conservative organizations have threatened the author to interrupt the book launch presentation in Lviv. Larissa Denisenko, the human rights activist and the writer fearing for the safety of the children attending the book launch, cancelled part of the event. The other part, an adult discussion on the subject, are schools prepared to discuss complicated topics with children went ahead and with extra security. Meanwhile, the book had become popular and widely shared online. We have here Nadia Parfan, who is the Ukrainian uh, film director and culturologist to discuss the issue. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, but before we would watch our report. My name is Maya, and I have two moms. People often wonder how it happened, but it's no miracle. I don't have a father, he's a secret donor. But my moms aren't secret, they are very real. They love each other, and they love me. These are lines from the book Maya and her mothers, which caused an uproar in the Ukrainian city of Lviv and subsequently in the whole of Ukraine. A book launch for children was meant to take place at Lviv Library on September 15th. But the book's author, Ukrainian writer and human rights activist Larissa Denisenko, had to cancel part of the launch due to the numerous threats she received. The author of the book, Larissa Denisenko, received such threats in absolutely different forms, including private messages. Around two weeks before the launch, we started receiving worrying letters. The publisher's forum started saying that different publishing houses have been receiving threats from far-right organizations, who have been saying that they don't want the book launch to go ahead, and that they will do everything to ensure that it doesn't if the city administration doesn't take measures itself. A letter, signed by 15 different but mostly little-known public organizations, was sent to the head of the Ukrainian security service in the Lviv region, the mayor of Lviv and the head of the Lviv regional state administration. The letter claims that the book is dedicated to same-sex intercourse and is a direct attempt to force upon school children destructive principles that are contrary to values and traditions formed in Ukrainian families. Densenko says she was in favor of this cancellation herself. The book discussion for adults, planned for the same day, still went ahead with additional security. It was the kids' event that got cancelled, the book launch for the children at the Lviv Library. I myself was in favor of this cancellation only with safety in my mind. I was not given enough information as to how the police would be getting involved. The event was for primary school kids, but honestly I cannot prevent the bad behavior for a few abnormal people. In fact, the book tells 17 different stories of 17 different families. Some families are Crimean Tatar and were forced to move to Kiev due to the annexation of Crimea. Some are of Roma origin. In some, the father is missing in action since Russia invaded Ukraine. This book just shows that there is no such term as perfect and there is no such thing as a traditional perfect family. Every family has its own story and it's normal and there is no crime in that. The main thing that a family needs to have, especially for the sake of the kids, is love and respect. And this is in essence what the book is about. There are only a few sentences on the last two pages that feature a same-sex couple, written from the perspective of Maya herself, but the far-right organizations see this situation differently. As a nationalist, a Christian, a Lviv resident and a father bringing up my own children, I think it's just unacceptable. Have you read the book yourself? Parts of it. Like what exactly? About test tubes, artificial insemination and so on. I think that's too much for kids aged six and older. Both the publishing house and the book's author say that the far-right activists who wrote the letter have not actually read the book. They were offended by the book's title, because 100% they haven't read it. Despite some strong negative reactions, the book proved to be quite popular in Ukraine. The first two print runs have completely sold out, so a third printing is currently underway and is due to come out in the end of October. After the scandal emerged, the publishing house and Denisenko also decided to upload a free PDF of the book online so that more people can read it and understand what it's really about. We know that within 24 hours there were a couple of thousand downloads of the book. I think that overall the story spread to perhaps around 100 to 100 thousand people. We're happy that so many people found out about this book, because the reviews we received after they read the book were really touching and inspiring. This book will have a sequel, and not just one. We planned that even before this whole situation emerged. We know that we're doing a good thing, so I think everything will be alright. Nadia, you are in the Ukrainian 
cultural sphere for some time, organizing different kind of events. And is it something new? You know, how do you see this this whole story with the threats? Um, what is your take on that? First of all, as a person from the cultural field, I must say that I really enjoyed the book. I think this is one of the best recent Ukrainian books. I was happy to read it myself. I really liked the way it was made, the illustrations, and I will definitely buy it to all my nieces and nephews. So I just think it's a big success for Ukrainian cultural production in terms of mere quality. Then also, I found it a very progressive book, and it was a bit strange to me that the discussion turned into the question of LGBT because it is also a book about internally displaced people, for instance, and this is a burning issue today in Ukraine. And this book shows a very nice depiction of diversity and just a normal society where people are different and where people are from, you know, Donetsk, ivano frankivsk Lviv, ivano Odessa. And I really like that because I feel that Ukraine is diverse and it forms a realistic image of our society. And then I was uh, really happy to see the amount of consolidation and sort of the solidarity that the Ukrainian, I don't know, it, could it be cultural sphere or some type of society, subculture I belong to, but this was the first time that I remember that there was a really united, solidaric position of the community. Everybody was happy to support the authors and the publishing house, and I was actually quite surprised to, to uh, hear the news about the very negative reaction, including security service. Um, I would like also to bring the... Uh, the uh quotes of uh, some kind of uh, the Ukrainian uh, officials, for instance, vice prime minister, another MP, the head of the think tank dealing with NATO, and there are the issues, that's what they've uh, written on their social uh, media platforms. I'm shocked by the threats the publishers forum in Lviv received. This can be neither understood nor accepted. Nobody gave the permission to these uneducated and aggressive groups of provocateurs to make our traditions their own and to defend them in such shameful way. It looks like we were brought up in a different country than these self-proclaimed fighters for truth because Ukrainian families are definitely not about threats and blackmail. Our values are first and foremost about respect. That's the way I was brought up by my parents and that's how my husband and I raise our daughters. I would like to congratulate Larissa Denisenko on the fact that people all over the country are inquiring about her book Maya and her moms at bookshops. Dear Larissa, your book is truly in short supply. By some kind of a miracle, I managed to order 10 copies for my relatives and friends. I will give them to everyone. I'm calling for everyone reading this post to do the same. This will be our response to people who decided to lecture the whole nation on whom they should love. Our solidarity and love is hundreds of times stronger than your hatred. I think we need to give credit to the provocateurs of this scandal because now Maya and her mothers is selling like hotcakes. I am pleased that dozens of times more people will now read it. I've bought two copies and will give my colleague one of them as a gift. I am actually wondering whether the Patriot boys who threatened the author and the publisher realize that they mirror the actions of the Russian establishment that they're supposedly fighting against. And a special kudos to Larissa Denisenko, whom I've admired for a long time. Every household needs to have a Maya book because it is really a wonderful piece of writing. I didn't know anything about it until today. These idiots cannot even comprehend the popularizing effect that their savage actions have had. With the permission of the author and the publisher, you can read it online, but it's better to support the author and buy a hard copy. So, as I said, there were the quotes of the vice prime minister of NMP and of the, I don't know, the analyst on the security, which so shows uh, some kind of the, uh, the, the different people. Uh, and uh, how do you see, was it enough? And, you know, there were, the Ukrainian civil society were pretty cautious to get into the controversial issues during the time of the war, during the time of Russian propaganda, which put the issue of the far right uh, and neo-Nazi uh, you know, very high. So there is no honest, you know, we, we can say that there is no really that discussion. So do you think this is some kind of a new move or? 
I think it's an impulse, but I definitely don't think it's enough. But I think it's a very symptomatic case of the fight over the younger generation. Because we can't change what elderly people think, and they have their reasons to do so, but the question is, what do the youngsters think? And I think it's very important to implement this worldview, the set of values represented by this book into our education and into the way we talk to kids and teenagers. So if I were the Minister of Education, I would just buy a copy for each uh, school student in Ukraine and have it in libraries and everywhere in public institutions. And still there is this question of the threat. So do you f how safe do you feel? And also do you think what are the ways also to discuss the issues in particular during the, the time of the war? Because, you know, LGBT pride, there would be always the voices, not marginal voices, but some kind of a credible voices who would say, that's not the time, you know, or these are the kids. How do you think you start this discussion in the Ukrainian society? Uh, beyond this group of people we belong to, you know, the Kiev residents, yeah. Yeah, uh, with the That's a very good question. Um work to be done, but I also want to emphasize that to me this is not only a book about LGBT, and I think the way to resolve this issue lies through dialogue with different marginalized groups, like internally displaced people, I don't know, single mothers that are also depicted as a role model, so just understanding the diversity and not focusing, maybe talking about the fact that it's not so much about LGBT, but just about accepting difference and different ways we can be. And probably also one thing should be said about the role of police and governmental institutions, that it's their duty to protect this European choice of Ukraine. And uh, we should feel safe and we should feel safe um, being different. So they should just do their job. And I know it's hard, but I wish them good luck and uh, let them keep safety. Nadia, thanks a lot for your uh, participation. Uh, that was Nadia Parfan, the Ukrainian film director and cultural scientist. Thank you from the entire team of Romatsky International. We are here to explain Ukraine and Eastern Europe for you. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook and goodbye.